our next um, uh, presenter uh, for our next session is Rebecca Tushna. Um, she teaches patent, trademark, and copyright law at the Harvard Law School. Uh, she is an avid puzzler and puzzle collector and has gotten quite interested in intellectual property issues that pertain to puzzle marketing and making. And when I asked her would she be willing to do this, she said, oh yeah, I've already done a, pre a similar presentation for lawyers. <laughs> so um, so go, Rebecca, go, please go ahead and uh, share your legal insights with us. Uh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, stopping your video so I can share mine. Yep. Excellent. All right, give me one second. Uh, okay, so uh, just a couple of notes uh, to start. Uh, this is not legal advice. Um, and uh, if, if it were, it'd be followed by a bill. Um, and I am going to give you some basic information. Um, this is made easier in some sense by the fact that uh, for many legal questions, the answer, the real answer is it depends. Um, so I'm gonna try and give you a sense of what it depends on. Um, so my talk is about images and cuts, uh, not about the process of making uh, puzzles, which is the realm of utility patent and trade secret. Um, utility patents can also cover specific puzzle designs if the design is new, useful, and non-obvious. Um, the basic idea is that utility patents cover inventions that do new things in the world. Uh, and patents, both design and utility, um, are, require a certificate from the government uh, agreeing uh, that you have something that qualifies for a patent. Um, however, there is a big problem of patent quality. Uh, especially when the patent examiner doesn't understand the field. So here is a utility patent on a jigsaw puzzle technique. The patent was granted in 1991. Puzzlers of long standing will probably be surprised that this could be patented. Uh, it's actually clearly invalid. Uh, the patentee claims to, invent, to have invented a technique of having a mostly rectangular puzzle embedded in the larger puzzle. Uh, the patent covers the idea regardless of the dimensions of the puzzle. It's not limited by the appearance of the drawing. Importantly, uh, utility patents and design patents can be infringed even if the infringer doesn't know about the patent and actually invented the device or design themselves. Um, and of course, this technique was not in fact invented by the patentee uh, or at least not invented only by the patentee. Here is a 1986 stave puzzle from my collection doing the same thing. Um, so this is what patent lawyers would call prior art available to the public. It completely anticipates the claimed invention. The patent shouldn't have been granted at all. Uh, so an important lesson to start out with is just because someone says they have an intellectual property right, even if they have a certificate from the government, that doesn't mean the right is truly valid. However, fighting an intellectual property claim can still be very expensive. Fortunately for everyone, uh, that patent, which was never valid, has now expired. Uh, here's another expired utility patent from 1997 uh, for a style that could be physical or digital. It cites Ann Williams' book uh, as a uh, point of interest. Uh, here's another utility patent, this one from 2000. Uh, now, this is interesting. Here's a 2013 utility patent for a double-sided tessellated jigsaw puzzle and method of making the same. And uh, you can see that the patentee also claims copyright protection. Um, it is possible for types of intellectual property protection to overlap. Their limits and what they cover may differ, but the same object may be subject to different IP regimes. Uh, the most common overlap is copyright and trademark, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so this one uh, is still in force, um, but uh, and it claims tessellation. Um, so it's not limited to the specific tessellation shown. Um, uh, so there are also would be issues of validity to the extent that, of course, tessellation in puzzles was quite well known uh, for a long time. Uh, here's a 2012 patent on a complete inner and outer jigsaw puzzle. This one is two is still in effect. 
I'd be surprised if it was actually valid because I expect that other examples of this concept were available to the public long before this patent was filed, though I don't happen to have any in my collection. Uh, if that patent is valid, and this is an important point about utility patents, if that utility patent is valid, then this design infringes it because utility patent is not about appearance. It's about the new and useful basically concept that has been uh, reduced to practice by the patentee. Uh, so uh, uh, utility patents can be quite broad. They're quite rare in, uh, in jigsaw puzzles, however. More relevant uh, and more likely to be valid are design patents, which is a different kind of patent. You don't hear much about it, but it is increasingly important if you heard about the lawsuit between Apple and Samsung in which Apple was awarded a billion dollars. That was for design patent infringement. Uh, design patents also require a certification from the government, but they are much easier to get. They're also much more limited. They really are limited to the new appearance of an article of manufacture. And a jigsaw puzzle is an article of manufacture. They are, so they're narrow, they are confined to the appearance um, and very close approximations, basically commercially indistinguishable versions, uh, but they're very strong within their range. If the design patent is valid, there are very few defenses. So this is a fractally divisible jigsaw puzzle design patent from 2021. That amazing Rome puzzle that we saw yesterday would not uh, anticipate or you know, be, uh, be covered by uh, this design patent because it doesn't look almost identical to this design patent, even if it uses the same concept of having piece-shaped sections. So that's, uh, that's a big difference between design and utility patents. So another uh, design patent, this is of the front surface for a jigsaw puzzle. And this highlights design patent can cover the appearance of a surface as well as the cut. Um, another design patent from 2014. So you can see uh, design patents can be granted even if they're very similar to things that have gone before, as long as uh, you can see what the difference is. Uh, and, uh, and here, unless there's something that was essentially exactly the same that existed before, um, this is probably valid. Um, it might be a little bit on the borderline given how common the dissected map uh, what is. This is a design patent for a cylindrical jigsaw puzzle, which I actually have in my collection. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, uh, it's okay. Um, here's one for a rectangular jigsaw puzzle from 1999. And I show you this one uh, because uh, I wanna show you the limits of design patent protection. So here you can see this very uh, sort of rectangular swiveling, uh, sort of rectangular spiral type of design. This is Peruvian tapestry from Artifact, which actually, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it from the back. It, it, it's clearly a very similar concept, but it's not the exact same and it's got whimsies in it. If this, if the one I just showed you were still in force, this would not infringe it because it is not essentially identical to the patent design. So design patent law is pretty serious about protecting appearance and not protecting ideas, like the idea of a particular uh, kind. So one thing about design patents, so each of these three is actually a distinct patentable design. The patentee got three different patents because none of these would be close enough to infringe the others, even though they all clearly have the same idea. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the, the way in which design patent is narrow. Copyright is actually much broader. Copyright protects original expression. Copyright is also automatic. Um, it, there's no requirement for registering with, uh, with the government. The copyright attaches as soon as you create the original work. Uh, the standard of, for protection is quite low. The work must merely be original to the author and a small amount of creativity is enough. So there are a bunch of copyright questions puzzle cutters might be interested in. So you're using an image from outside your own creation. Uh, if you're making your own copies, then uh, you probably want to use a public domain image, uh, so one that's old enough or that's from the United States government, uh, or one that's freely usable, and there are ways to find uh, freely uh, licensable art online, um, or you want to license the making of the copy. 
Is there a workaround though? Um, what if you buy a copy from an authorized source so you're not making your own and you attach it to the puzzle surface? This actually should be a really easy question. There's a complete scholarly consensus on this question, but if you're in California, you actually need to watch out. So a court in California did hold that removing an image from a book and attaching it to a ceramic tile creates a so-called derivative work that you can't create without the copyright owner's permission. So even if you aren't making a copy, you are infringing the right to create a derivative work. The derivative work right is essentially, uh, it is what let book, it lets book authors control whether a movie is made from their book. It's an adaptation right. Um, now, is putting a piece of paper on a ceramic tile really an adaptation? Uh, the answer is no, despite this uh, court uh, uh, decision. And another court in Illinois, uh, in, in, in a case involving note cards attached to ceramic tiles, uh, just disagreed correctly and said, look, you're just using the image that you yourself own. Uh, it is not and you don't create an infringing derivative work when you write a note on a note card. You don't create an infringing derivative work when you write notes in the margin of your textbook. Uh, so uh, when you own the copy, you are generally allowed to do a lot of different things uh, with that copy that may involve physically altering it in some way. So you shouldn't have to worry, but if you're in California, you do. Uh, there's also, I think, a, a somewhat interesting question. Uh, maybe that's usually the case that it doesn't create a derivative work to just cut a puzzle from an image that you have fixed onto a uh, cutting surface. Uh, but what if you are making color line cuts? And so you're sort of making a new uh, copy of images in the puzzle. It's possible that a court would say that that is actually a derivative work. Um, so, what about knockoffs? And I see there are questions and I, 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 I wanna talk about fair use at the end, so I will definitely get there. Um, so what, a, what if you don't own exclusive rights in the image? Is the cut itself protected against copying? Uh, and the answer I think is certainly against exact copying. Um, the cut probably has the necessary creativity in almost all cases. So uh, I think uh, lots of us have seen Unidragon knockoffs. Uh, I assume that Unidragon doesn't actually own the copyright in the image and just licensed it. So it can't go after those for, uh, for copying the image unless it has the exclusive right to use the image. Uh, but uh, if the cut is being copied, it can claim a copyright in that. Uh, but uh, there are these then interesting questions about what happens when there's uh, potentially an interaction with the image. As I mentioned, you can see partial color line cutting here. Uh, if that's a derivative work, you might need the consent of the owner of the copyright uh, to, in the image, even if you're using a copy that you purchased, and even if uh, you license the use to, to like making a copy from the copyright owner because the reproduction right and the derivative work right are actually separate rights and you, you, you need the right that you're using. So what are the limits of copyright protection? Uh, before we get to fair use, one key limit is the idea expression distinction. So copyright protects expression, not ideas. None of these infringe the others. These are, this is easy. They implement simple, similar ideas with their own variations. Relatedly, what is protectable by copyright is a different question from what kind of copying is enough to infringe. So if, what you're, if you copy, but not exactly, uh, the copying may not be substantially similar. So the standard is substantial similarity. And uh, if the copying is not substantial sim uh, uh, substantially similar, then it is not unlawful even if the challenged work looks pretty similar to the copyright owner's work. So the bees on the right are not similar enough to the bees on the left to infringe the copyright in the bees on the left. Their similarities, the court held, came from the idea of making a jeweled bee pin. And of particular interest to makers, I think, um, one of the things that the, the jewelry maker pointed out was uh, on the left, uh, the, the heads and eyes of the bees are actually cast. On the right, uh, the heads and eyes are created by coiling wire together. Uh, and that apparently uh, produces a different effect, even if you know from this distance, they look pretty similar. So uh, 
what does this mean for whimsies or figurals? Uh, again, this is where it depends comes in. So the more details are in the image that you start with, the less likely it is that the outline of the image alone is enough to be substantially similar. Here, the court held that the jump man silhouette is so different from the original image up top that the only similarity was similarity in ideas. Here's another case, uh, maybe. Uh, so this is a photo and this stained glass window allegedly infringed the photo. The court held that the, they were only similar in idea, not in expression because the aesthetic effect was so different. And it helps to know that uh, the, this is a traditional pose in Hawaiian dance. And of course, there are only so many ways, uh, so many angles where you can capture a lot of detail from this pose. And so the fact that it was a similar pose and a similar angle um, and a similar overall effect was not enough to constitute infringement. Same result here. These are drawings that start with the same fossil. It's just unsurprising that they look pretty similar uh, when you start with the same fossil and reconstruct the scene. Uh, this is the same here. The sculptor used the photo uh, on the left as a reference image, but the court held that the similarities in the result came from the natural appearance of the animals. And so the, the photographer couldn't have a monopoly over that. Okay. Uh, so definitely uh, the idea expression comes into play, uh, but what if the cutter is copying the outline really closely? So it's arguably not just the idea. And the, if the images are sufficiently general, there may be no copyright at all in the outlines. So there are court cases saying, for example, a dog bone. Uh, there's just, there, you, you can't make a dog bone in, in very many ways and have it be recognizably a dog bone. Uh, so even if you're straight up copying somebody else's dog bone, um, that's not infringing uh, because there's just not enough there to protect. However, uh, if a cutter starts with an image that is already a silhouette, there may be more at risk. And again, and for, for now I'm setting fair use aside, just, you know, is it infringing to copy a silhouette like this? So sometimes the standard can be pretty low. Uh, one court has held that the bird outline here is sufficiently creative to be copyrightable. Uh, and so someone who directly copies those could infringe. If you draw your own bird outline freehand uh, and it ends up looking a lot like this though, uh, that's just copying the idea. Um, the cases that I found that are probably most closely related to uh, whimsy cutting are about die cutting machines uh, and people who make the templates for these die cutting machines. Um, and uh, on the left are some of the outlines that courts thought were sufficiently original to be protected by copyright because of the specific decisions the creators made. For example, in the ruin on the lower left, uh, they decided exactly where to change the outline of the top of, uh, of, the, of the ruin. And they decided exactly where to put the little bends in the leaves. On the right are outlines that are not sufficiently original to have any copyright protection at all. So uh, what does that all mean for puzzles? Uh, so here are some very similar birds, uh, sort of in the general sense, they're laser cut and hand cut. No one could credibly think that the second infringes the first. They are both just the same idea. And of course, uh, the things that we uh, that we talk about in puzzles, like for example, the need to keep a, an arm whimsy from being sort of super fragile and easily broken, um, also affect the the range of options that you have and will also bear in uh, bear on what counts as idea versus what counts as expression. So uh, so anything that you do uh, to to keep the puzzle from falling apart um, is not going to be within the scope of copyright protection. Uh, but let me show you a fascinating edge case. So this is a Liberty puzzle flat irons with this uh, gorgeous bird uh, and. Here is, on the right, a puzzle from a non-Liberty maker. They clearly copied it. The kind of interesting thing to me is 
it's not like that in the assembled puzzle. So the, the, the copying maker didn't actually plunk the assembled bird in. They did something that, as far as I know, no Liberty puzzle has done. They broke it up into the puzzle and then made it a second puzzle that you could assemble outside. Uh, most courts, I believe, would hold that this infringes the Liberty bird. Um, but they might reason from the shape of the individual pieces and call those individual pieces original enough to be protected. Because in the puzzle itself, they actually, you know, you don't see the bird. Uh, and so it's a little harder to say there's substantial similarity. Before um, uh, finishing the discussion of whimsies, I want to add in another type of law, because this will help us get to fair use, which is trademark law. Uh, so trademark is not artistic, but commercial. Trademark protects consumers against confusion in their purchasing decisions. As long as something is distinctive, uh, which it means recognizable as a brand name, it will be protected by the law, even if it doesn't have much of a commercial reputation. So, uh, you know, the marks on the left are, are well known among puzzlers as high quality. Uh, the marks on the, uh, on the right are largely not, um, but they are both valid trademarks because we look at them and we understand, ah, uh, this is a particular maker. Registration is not required in the United States to have a valid trademark, but it is useful in litigation. It gives you some advantages. Uh, and actually for anyone who sells on Amazon, registration is very significant. So the most interesting puzzle question is not about the puzzle brands, but what are the rules about using recognizable trademarks as whimsies? So this question also implicates copyright because many recognizable outlines might also be subject to copyright protection. And uh, in puzzles, uh, the, you see the same thing that you have to see in many other groups. Uh, often a group will treat outsiders as sources of inspiration, but the group does not approve of copying from uh, among insiders, so other puzzle makers. This happens with tattoo artists who freely take stuff from outside, but don't like it when tattoo artists copy each other. It happens with comedians, it happens with research scientists. Uh, and I think this is also true of puzzle makers. Copying the stave clown would be a very different thing than copying the outline of Ronald McDonald. Although I can imagine a puzzle that would be quite interesting that where all the whimsies were different uh, maker uh, uh, whimsies. Um, but this is important because lots of items of popular culture may implicate trademark claims. So here's an example of a Batmobile where the outline might be recognizable. Uh, the Batmobile is protected by copyright. It is also, uh, the shape of the Batmobile is also a registered trademark, registered for toys, uh, in particular toy cars. Uh, and there's also a design patent covering the Batmobile. So uh, here are some Winnie the Pooh whimsies from a stave puzzle in my collection. Uh, if you made poo merchandise, the copyright and trademark owner would definitely come after you. What then is the status of these? Um, so I would call jigsaw puzzles artistic works. And as such, uh, as incorporated into an artistic work, um, there's almost certainly no question of trademark liability. Um, because uh, the interest in artistic free speech allows people to use trademarks uh, in artistic works as long as they aren't explicitly confusing. So if you said, you know, official poo puzzle, uh, then you would have a problem. But, if, but poo whimsies are not going to be a problem. Likewise, I think that this is copyright fair use, although, uh, frankly, that is a closer question, um, because uh, for fair use, we usually look for something that is transformative in some way that uh, changes the meaning or message uh, of the copyrighted work. Uh, so another example of recognizable silhouettes from various franchises that may implicate both copyright and trademark. So for example, the silhouette of the enterprise, uh, the enterprise is, is basically a, co a copyrighted character uh, and has been recognized as such in, in uh, several decisions um, and also might be subject to trademark protection. But again, I think that uh, this, is, uh, this is protected by the First Amendment. Um, and the interesting thing here is, you know, the image is, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, a federal government image, you know, there's no copyright in it at all. Uh, the puzzle cutter almost certainly thought I'm completely covered and uh, didn't uh, necessarily contemplate uh, the separate question of the whimsies. Now, before, uh, before I get to the questions and talk about fair use, 
Um, I will say, I think the puzzle cutter is probably right, right? Uh, there are problems when we uh, constrain our behavior to that which uh, the only uh, uh, someone who is really cautious would do. Sometimes you should just be making the art. Um, but, you know, law, especially in this area, law is about risk, right? So what a lawyer can realistically tell you is sort of what's the level of risk here? Uh, not in most cases what a court would definitely do. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think it's actually important for us uh, as supporting artists to encourage them to, uh, to use uh, fair use rights so that uh, we sort of keep it as a muscle that is healthy uh, and, don't, and don't cringe away from assertions of intellectual property rights. So I think I do have time uh, uh, to get to the questions. Um, so maybe I can scroll back uh, and, and address them if that is okay uh, with, with everyone. Wow, Rebecca, that was really um, mind boggling. Uh, so much information to take in there. And when we have a lot of questions and some of them get pretty deep into the weeds. So I don't know that we'll get to all of them. We have uh, about 15 or 20 minutes. No, actually maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, we, we have a, um, uh, another session that starts at 3.30 and we want to have a, a break before that of 10 to 15 minutes. So I think we have okay. plenty of time to deal with um, um, your, uh, a lot of these questions. I do want right. to ask, could you make a distinction between someone who is essentially a hobbyist making puzzles for family and friends and they want to make a picture of a star uh, puzzle out of a star wars poster right. a one off kind of thing versus someone who, who wants to cut that poster into a um uh something they're going to sell so i i uh, this is something that uh, surprises and dismays many people. Um, but legally speaking, um, I would not say that there is a, 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 a noticeable difference between those two scenarios. Now, uh, a couple of things about that. Uh, first, right, I, as I said, both of those things should almost certainly be okay. Uh, certainly, especially like if you're not making a copy of the poster, um, then you, sh uh, you should be fine. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to deter people from doing it. But uh, the, diff the difference is really actually in the level of risk of detection and getting a nasty gram from, uh, the, from in, in this case, Disney. Now, now Disney has, over the past uh, de a couple decades, uh, learned some hard lessons about how it's dumb to do that. Uh, because you know these tend to be your best customers, and you really don't want to make them embittered uh, with something that is really uh, at worst harmless to them, and at best actually helpful to them. Um, but you know, if you're putting stuff on Etsy, uh, you know it is more likely that Disney's lawyers will see you, right? Uh, and that's that is the big difference. Not in, because uh, these days. Uh, copyright does not distinguish very strongly between commercial and non-commercial uses. It, it is a factor in fair use, but it's often not the most important one. Um, uh, and likewise, trademarks, surprisingly, even though it's supposed to be about commercial use, has reached very far into uh, artistic work, which has then led to the creation of basically a free speech defense that now robustly protects both commercial artists and people who are doing it non-commercially. So, uh, so uh, I'm sorry for such a long answer, but it's an important question, and it's and it's quite counterintuitive, I think. Okay, so, let's, so let's see. Uh, so um, I just want to point out. So uh, Joe uh, points out that he has uh, 50 to 200 year old examples of almost any cutting style, right? And this is uh, I don't claim that any of these are valid. Um, although the design patents may be valid if they show basically a tiny difference from what has come before, but their scope will then be only exactly what they have done, right? So uh, I think despite the example, I'm sure that you have an example of a similar cutting style for that diagonal uh, 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 puzzle, but it's probably still a valid design patent. It's just a super narrow one. Um, so let's see, uh, Dennis Fisher asks, what's the distinction between derivative works and fair use? Ah, okay, so this is a question that people fight about in my field a lot. 
Um, so uh, the derivative work right, uh, I think at, at its core is about sort of uh, legitimate markets for, you know, real adaptations of the original. So, you know, the owner uh, of the rights in Winnie the Pooh really should get to decide whether somebody makes a Winnie the Pooh movie um, and, you know, sequels to Winnie the Pooh and so on. However, uh, there are a lot of ways that people might use Winnie the Pooh or talk about Winnie the Pooh that don't really fall within that sort of uh, kind of standard adaptation. Um, and that is where fair use comes into play. So certainly like if you're writing a book review um, or maybe if you write a, if you create a political cartoon and uh, Winnie the Pooh comes to sort of tell you a, a lesson, there's actually a great book a couple years back um, by uh, an artist who did who did the full Apple terms of service, but each page was illustrated in the style of a different artist. Uh, it was brilliant. Uh, and I think it was clearly a fair use, even though the two things didn't necessarily start out having anything to do with one another, but by putting them in this comic context, you got a kind of new uh, appreciation of both. Um, so I didn't give you a very specific answer because there isn't really a specific answer until you get the, into the details of each case. I think, for example, the Pooh whimsies are not a derivative work of the Pooh books because they're just pictures of Pooh and they're put into this, uh, you know, uh, 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 classic art scene. Uh, and uh, you get a different understanding of them as kind of uh, characters uh, representing some of the whimsy of childhood, uh, no pun intended, I guess. Uh, but they don't tell a new Pooh story or anything like that. So uh, uh, Melinda, uh, I get, I'm not sure if your last name is Stowe or that's Stowe, Massachusetts, sorry, uh, says, if you buy a lot of copies of an image, make lots of puzzles and sell them, is this not, this is not a drive product, right? And so the, the, the scholarly answer is no, uh, that's, de that's not a derivative work with the caveat about, you know, maybe if the cut is color line cutting, maybe that cut wood is now a derivative work. Um, but also, if you live in California, you have to worry because there is this dumb decision out there. And the other thing that, uh, that I think non-lawyers don't, uh, don't always understand is like, it's a big country. You can find a case that says, at, at least one case that says almost anything, uh, but that doesn't make the case right. But it does mean that the environment can be a little more complicated. But if you're not uh, in the Ninth Circuit, which is mostly California, uh, I would say, no, you don't, you don't. Uh, 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 that is not a derivative work. Uh, and also, honestly, I, uh, if, if that case came to the Ninth Circuit today, uh, they would probably do, uh, they would probably agree with the Illinois court that they were dumb the first time. Um, so Chris Yates asks, who decides significant similarity? Oh, so the, the, the test is substantial similarity uh, for copyright infringement. Um, and the answer is, again, it depends. So a judge can sometimes decide that because the similarities between two works are all from the idea, then uh, the judge can decide to throw the case out. But if the judge says, well, maybe these are ideas or maybe this is close enough to be copying of the expression, then it should go to a jury unless the parties agree that they'll just let the judge decide it. And that's just a, sta a standard feature of United States cases in general. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Natalia says, uh, has a screenshot, which uh, I will have to download. Wait, maybe. Uh, right. So, uh, and so I think actually the, the screenshot here, which I think shows two cats in a sort of Egyptian style, um, I think this one is easy. Uh, no, those two are not substantially similar. They definitely share the same idea, um, but you can see like the positioning is different, the outline is different, the colors are different, um, especially when you have a market that is actually at this point pretty well developed, you can see that all these people entered the market saying, oh, you know, Unidragon is doing very well, I'll make a bunch of similar images. And if they are using similar images that the, you know, somebody else has drawn, uh, then no, you know, the, the artists, they're just artists doing similar styles. Um, uh, let's see. 
so uh, I think Dave uh, Elliott asks, if I buy a calendar, why can't I glue up each picture? Right. So this is the same issue a, 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 as before. And I think the, the correct answer is you can't, um, but with the caveats uh, uh, above. Um, okay. Uh, so Rick Tucker asks, please comment on Bridgman uh, versus Corel. I've taken thousands of photographs of items in, in my collection, how to control how others may use them. So Bridgman is a case about uh, basically high quality images of, uh, of well-known or, or obscure uh, old art. So the, the pictures themselves, uh, the, the artwork, uh, the paintings were so old that there, was, they, there never was any copyright or they are out of copyright even if, if, if copyright ever existed. And um, the, the, the photographers with significant effort, right? It was hard to get really good pictures, but what they did, you know, they achieved really good pictures that people agreed, you know, basically represented those artworks, right? It were, it were pretty much as good as you can get. And the court said, copyright is about protecting originality. So originality means that the, work has its origin with the person who is claiming copyright. Like if you didn't make anything that uh, any new expression, you aren't a copyright owner. So in the Corel case, the court said, look, these are just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're much better than photocopies of the artwork, but they aren't different in creativity. They're different in effort, but effort does not make copyright. Right, hard work is not what we're reward, re rewarding. We're re rewarding originality. So uh, the basic answer is uh, you can uh, uh, protect it. Uh, you know, if if your pictures are of three D objects, uh, then your pictures are definitely protectable. If uh, because you will have made some choices in presenting the three D object that will be copyrightable. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you are really representing a 2D object, there may not be anything there. Uh, but I will say, you know, the standard is quite low if you'll, uh, the, for protectability. So uh, if you give me a second, I will pull up from my class notes, um, if I can, uh, something showing like how low the standard really is. Um, ah, okay, hang on, I'm gonna, so, uh, if you give me a second, I'll do this. While you're while you're looking for that, I'm going to yep. launch your our poll. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so these are photographs that uh, a court held uh, w uh, were original enough to be copyrightable. Right, so the person uh, who took them made some choices about lighting, about where to, you know, put the focus, like how close to stand to the person, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, let's see, I can go if I can go backwards. Uh, so these pictures were totally standard Chinese food pictures, and they were just sort of realistic uh, pictures of Chinese food, and these are not copyrightable. Okay. Um, uh, so Joe asks, Shutterstock has copyrighted images from 19th century newspapers. Is this valid? No. Uh, I mean, there might have once been a valid copyright, but those are expired. Uh, <laughs> John Stokes made a puzzle of several hundred company logos. Is this artistic expression? Interestingly enough, the Supreme Court recently decided a case, Google against Oracle, where there's a footnote that explicitly says um, a painting of a company logo might, uh, uh, might well be a fair use. And especially if you're doing uh, several hundred, there's uh, a, a, any court is gonna consider that to be a commentary on our modern society. Uh, so Dennis asks, um, uh, uh, is the date for transition from copyright into public domain the same for images as in music? Uh, so this is a super complicated question because the regime changed so much during the 20th century, especially for music. Um, so the core answer is yes, it is the same but a detailed answer would require me to know exactly the dates that you were talking about because it hasn't always been the same. So, you know, depending on 
uh, what we're talking about, we might need a different set of answers. So uh, uh, a question about the waterfowl uh, stamp. So this is a great question. Um, and the answer is that it is possible for the US government to commission stuff that is copyrighted. The stuff that is not copyrighted is a work produced by the US government. So uh, I would, I, I think the answer is uh, that, uh, that that artwork is likely uh, to have a, a valid copyright because it doesn't count as a work of the U.S. government. Um, but I would want to, you know, read a little more to see, you know, if they, if they, for example, make the winner transfer the copyright to the U.S. government. For, if, for example, the answer could be different. So, oh, Joe, sorry, I'm scrolling through. Um, Joe asks uh, an incredibly uh, interesting question. So, suppose I cut up a poster or calendar. Can I show a picture of my work on? Uh, a website. And the interesting thing here is that uh, that is actually uh, quite, it's an important question, even if you have authorized the right to make copies from the artist, um, because the, uh, the, uh, the artist may have authorized you to make reproductions in pictures, uh, but unless you also have permission, specific permission uh, to, to then put the pictures on a website, you're actually doing a different thing. You're, you're, you're implicating a different right. So uh, you should either put that in your contract that you can advertise the, the results or you have to rely on an implied uh, authorization or you have to rely on fair use. So in all cases, the image on your website is, it's a copy, right? It's a reproduction in pixels of the, the thing. Um, and so you, 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 need a, you need a new uh, justification, which you probably have. The good news for puzzle makers is uh, puzzle ma puzzles, I think, are what's called useful articles. Uh, so they're something that uh, does more than just represent an image. Um, you can take them apart, you can put them back together. And there's a special rule for useful articles saying it's okay to take pictures of them for, to use in advertising or commentary. Um, that it doesn't infringe the copyright if the if the image has been lawfully incorporated into the useful article. So good news uh, as, uh, uh, for that. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to talk about implied license or fair use. Uh, but because of that special statutory provision, I don't think we need to. Uh, so Conrad, uh, Right, so uh, so I can see this is a uh, we have like one minute left. I'm trying to get to the end. Uh, we can see that uh, this this issue is of great concern. Uh, you know, a puzzle maker versus a frame shop. And again, this is the derivative work question. And uh, you know, uh, I, I wish I could tell you, uh, you know, there's actually no risk at all. But there is this dumb case sitting out there. Uh, and and the uh, and indeed the frame shop is somewhat at at risk in the Ninth Circuit. Now that's so dumb that it doesn't happen, but you know, uh, it is what it is. Rebecca, you um, can take you can take another five minutes, I think. Uh, okay, I you know I don't want to uh, uh, you know I want to get to people's questions, but you know if people want to wander off and take their break, obviously, uh, uh, I play should do that. Um, so there's a question from Beth uh, Muffson: uh, Are images okay to use if they are more than seventy years old? Um, so uh, again, this is a, su a, a, a question that actually requires a lot more detail to, to answer. Um, in some cases, they may never have had a valid copyright at, at all. And so the copyright may be expired long before then. T the current regime for, for an image that is created today, it is life of the author plus 70 years. So that's where the 70 years uh, uh, number comes from. Um, for stuff before 1978, it's 95 years from creation uh, or 120 years from publication uh, if, uh, uh, if that's uh, basically if that's short. Um, or sorry, if it, um, uh, it's been a while since I've actually taught this. I'm coming around to it in a couple months. So um, the point being, there are a bunch of complicated rules. There are some interesting flow charts. If you know some basic details about your image, um, there is a thing called the durationator uh, that can actually walk you through 
uh, the, the flow chart to tell you. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a rule of thumb is 95 years from publication for older images. Uh, for newer ones, it's going to be life plus 70. Uh, Deb Dana asked, do you see puzzles as an area where more cases will be emerging? It's an interesting question, right? Because I think with the, the emergence of laser cutting sort of in the wild during the pandemic, um, there's now fertile ground for it, right? When things were uh, very limited, you know, when the community was limited, uh, there's just less reason uh, for people to sue each other. Uh, but now, uh, especially with the rise of eBay and, and Amazon, there might well be justification for more. Uh, Ann Williams asks, if I get sued for copyright infringement, what courts can the case go through uh, and ditto for pat trademark and patent infringement? So in the United States, uh, you would start in a federal district court. And uh, there are a couple of different choices. Basically, uh, you want some place where you can get your hands on the defendants. So that would often be uh, somewhere that the defendant is located or at least somewhere that the defendant has sold to. Uh, and then for copyright and trademark, uh, basically it can go anywhere uh, in the country. Uh, for patent, uh, it can start anywhere in the country, but all the appeals are consolidated in a federal court in DC, although it's sort of, it, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to get there. Ah, uh, can it, all right, tilt my monitor so you can see the earrings clearly. Yes, I have an extensive collection of uh, puzzle uh, jewelry at this point, and I wanted to show off something. Uh, uh, Etsy is my friend. Uh, so Glinda says, what I'm hearing is it's pretty impossible to guess what might be copyrighted. So, you know, I, I actually think that you just need some details, right? So sometimes what you really need is to look at what the plaintiff did and what the defendant did. So I think that the image that Natalia uh, shared was really useful because that's just a super concrete example that says, uh, that helps us think through, okay, is what is similar about this the idea or is what is similar about this the, uh, the details of the expression? Um, but, you know, as you get closer and closer to the silhouette, uh, it does, you know, you will have to, uh, you will have to make some decisions, but but I think you know the, we can definitely place markers, right? So I have no problem saying that the Hamilton outline uh, is copyrightable, um, and I have no problem saying that a bone outline is not. And then we just you know think about where you are on the dial. Okay, well Rebecca, thank you so much, and I suggest that people who want to continue this discussion just. You know, uh, forego their uh, their break, and um, if Rebecca's willing, uh, you can just stay on the line. Uh, at, yeah, I see. There are some there are some questions about uh, the the Elvis and image rights, which I'd be happy to talk about for if people are interested. Um, but but for those yeah. who are those who are running off to take a break, I want yeah. you to be sure to. Um, uh, come back at 3.30 because Janelle is going to give us a wonderful presentation on her unique take on affixing art to a surface to cut a puzzle. So um, that's New York time, 3.30, and um, uh, we will reconvene then. If I may uh, just jump in for a second. Uh, this is Chris. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have 22 wonderful puzzle vendors in our virtual sales room right now over at puzzleparley.org slash sale. This is a great way to support our community and score a wonderful puzzle for yourself. Um, so we're just going to throw the slide up there for a little bit, but uh, Rebecca's going to hang out and answer a few more questions. Again, um, table sales are a great way to uh, show your support for the Puzzle Parley. And uh, thanks everybody, it's been a great show so far. So yeah, for anyone who wants to hear more, is <laughs> not sick of me already. Um, uh, the, there was this question about depicting people, right? So uh, Elv the owners of Elvis's publicity rights are particularly aggressive. Um, and But uh, in theory, uh, if 
if you uh, if you're making a puzzle from an from an existing image and, and you know you're putting it onto the puzzle, uh, there's a doctrine called first sale that should protect your activity. That doesn't mean you won't get a nasty gram from the Elvis people because they are very aggressive, um, but first first sale is what protects uh, most reuses. Just like someone who is just reselling the poster as is. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Rebecca. Yes. Uh, yeah, as long as we're on break, if people want to ask the questions in person, they can unmute themselves and ask. Uh, but uh, everybody should wait till Rebecca gets through the questions that are already posted. Right. Yeah, I just it, 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 I'm going in order because uh, there was a lot of there were a lot of discussion, which is great. Um, so let's see. Are murals in public spaces copyrightable? Yes. Uh, and in fact, a number of uh, fashion brands and the like have gotten sued of late uh, for uh, for using ad campaigns against public like graffiti uh, and uh, without the 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 permission of uh, the, the artists. Um, now I should say, again, when you're incorporating it into an artistic work that may well be fair use uh, because uh, if you're, if you're and, and like movie makers have won all their cases where somebody sues them for, for capturing graffiti. Um, but on the other hand, if you're using it in an advertising campaign you probably do need to, to pay the artist even though it's in public. Uh, let's see. Um, took some pictures of 1940s puzzles of her old photos to have a picture of my collection and was told they would not print them because of copyright. Is that a valid concern? Right. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so is it possible that an image from the 1940s is still in copyright? Yes. Uh, and they aren't going to do the work for you. Uh, uh, is it likely? No. Uh, it's, it's, it's not very likely. Uh, for something that old, the copyright needed to be renewed uh, 28 years after publication. Uh, and if it wasn't renewed, the copyright expired then. That is almost certainly what happened. Um, and, and of course, even if, uh, it, uh, even if that weren't true, even if they were renewed, uh, I would think having a picture of your collection would still be fair use. But uh, a lot of intermediaries like Photoshop's uh, have gotten uh, very risk adverse advice. Uh, and so uh, uh, they, won't, they won't do it if there's even an ounce of uncertainty. And in our US system, you can often generate an ounce of uncertainty. Um, you know, you could do a, a commission, a report uh, to, to make sure that these hadn't been renewed. Uh, that's still, unfortunately, a bit expensive. Um, the, the records are slowly being digitized and eventually it will be easy to do, but it's not easy to do yet. Uh, any suggestions on how best to locate and retain the right local attorney? So if you are interested in doing this on a commercial scale and think it's worthwhile, um, or if you're facing sort of infringement challenges on Amazon or eBay, it probably is uh, worth thinking about a lawyer. Now, I would probably start uh, with uh, a, a couple of places. There's a group called Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, right? So, so uh, th that would be uh, volunteer, uh, maybe not what you would want, uh, but you might be able to find art-focused lawyers there. There are also in many uh, states these days, law schools that have business, small business clinics, uh, where the law students under the supervision of full, full attorneys uh, work to help small businesses with legal problems where the small business couldn't afford that much legal attention otherwise. And they often really like IP uh, issues because uh, those are things that often can be sort of chunked and navigated uh, over the course of a semester of a year. Uh, Let's see. Uh, isn't anything instantiated prior to 1925 uh, in the public domain? Uh, uh, basically, almost. Um, so, right, the, the old rules were 95 years um, from publication, uh, but there might be some unpublished works out there. And those uh, would, would be subject to uh, life plus 70. Um, so, you, it, it, so it is possible, say you have a young artist who creates something in 1919 uh, and it's never published and they die in, you know, 1990, uh, very old. It's life plus 70. Uh, it's not very likely, but, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, my job is to make these 
teeny little distinctions. So, uh, right, so Joe says, uh, right, there, there used to be a renewal requirement and now there isn't. Uh, and, and the last renewal term started a while ago. So what, whatever renewals needed to have happened either happened or didn't. Uh, any books on copyright, trademark and patent issues that you'd recommend? That's a great question. And it kind of depends on what you're interested in. So if you're basically interested in sort of, uh, you know, what, you know, what is like, how is the law made? What, what really happens? There's a great book by Jessica Littman called Digital Copyright, which is available for free online um, because she wanted to be available for people about various debates uh, in the 1990s and some updates about what happened next. Um, there's, uh, the, you know, there's just a, a bunch of good writing about things like, you know, the interaction between race and intellectual property. Um, so, so how that's played out over the years. Um, there's a woman named Anjali Vats, V-A-T-S, who has a new book about that. Um, you know, there, it kind of depends on what you want. I'd be happy to make more detailed suggestions if I can. Uh -huh. okay. All right, I think I reached the end, my God. So, uh, Rebecca? Yes. I have, I have a real quick question. Um, sure. I was the one that asked about the 25 years. I just wanted to know, suppose somebody painted a picture in 1900, they painted the actual oil painting, someone acquired mm -hmm. it to a private collection, and mm -hmm. you suddenly got, uh, you suddenly got to be able to take a picture of it and use it as a puzzle. Is that okay? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, uh, so this is a would be a great example. Um, the first question I would ask is when did the artist die? Because that sounds like it's unpublished unless there, there might be some other facts that, so, uh, you know, if there'd been other pictures of it taken or if it had been at some point displayed in a museum that was open to the public, it might've been published. But if, if it stayed unpublished, um, I would wanna know when the artist died because that would be life plus 70. Um, so, uh, so, so this is a great example of like, sometimes you need to know what you need to know before you uh, before you do the calculation. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. I, you know, that uh, uh, brings up a question for me is, I often see images that are actually in the public domain, say artworks mm -hmm. from the 1800s or something that the people have pictures of online and copyright mm -hmm. their pictures. And my understanding is that the Supreme Court has ruled that you must have made significant changes or you can't copyright something that's already in the public domain. Right. So this is the Corel decision. Um, and so it wasn't a Supreme Court decision, but um, it is one that uh, U U.S. courts uh, seem to, to follow. Um, because So the Supreme Court has, set, has explicitly said uh, that you need creativity. And it has explicitly said that hard work is not itself creativity, right? It can go hand in hand with, uh, but just because it was very hard to take a very good picture does not mean that you were creative. In fact, if you, uh, so, so the, the Supreme Court case is actually about uh, uh, white pages. Uh, for those of us who remember those, uh, the white pages are not copyrightable because even though it's a lot of work to create them, it's just an alphabetical list. There's not enough creativity. Um, and uh, so then, Later on, a, a lower court said uh, in Corel, um, what that means is just because it was really hard to do this really good picture, you know, it's still uh, no, it's still like a photo photocopy. There's actually another really interesting case where a really good 3D model created by very carefully running a laser arm over the physical object, also not copyrightable because even though it was a lot of work and you did have to like decide you know, when to turn the, the 3D, the measuring laser, those weren't creative choices. Those were all in the service of the same thing, making an accurate copy. So I would say no, uh, no copyright in accurate photos of 2D objects. If it's a 3D object, it's different because then there's a lot more choice going into uh, the angle and, and lighting effects. Okay, thank you very much. It's time for us to to come back from break. Huh? <laughs> so. Well, thank you guys. This is great. Thank you.